High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. I am your host, Dr. Onit Lev, an emergency and addiction doctor who has served at the White House and still practices on the front lines. Right here on High Truths, you will learn from experts, hear stories from the emergency department, and listen to people who have struggled from addiction. Friends, fentanyl is plaguing America. It has infected all illicit drugs, from cocaine to meth, counterfeit pills, and even marijuana. If you are around someone who may be using drugs, you should carry naloxone, the opioid reversal agent. Carrying naloxone for drugs is like carrying an EpiPen for allergies. If you need a prescription for naloxone, you should have one, no questions asked. That is why I am offering a free prescription to anyone who needs one. Come visit me on hightruths.com to learn more about the show, submit a question, or download a free prescription for naloxone. And if you like the show, do me a favor. Give us a five-star review and subscribe. Your stars are very much appreciated and go a long way in supporting the program. Today's episode is sponsored by Isaac, the International Academy on the Science and Impact of Cannabis. Visit their website, isaacone.org, I-A-S-I-C-1.org, to follow the science on marijuana. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be together again for another addicting and mentally high truths conversation. I'm your host, Dr. Onit Lev. Today, we're going to talk about the intersection of mental health and substance use disorder. Each year, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, publishes the key substance use and mental health indicators in the United States. This is the national data used for health policy. So let's check out the latest report from 2020 data. There were 37.9 million adults with substance use disorder, and there were 52.9 million adults with any mental illness. The intersection of people who had both substance use disorder and and any mental illness is 17 million. Therefore, 45% of people with substance use disorder had any mental illness, and 32% of people with mental illness had a substance use disorder. That's a large overlap. Now, let's add a pandemic. Then let's add increased availability of fentanyl and methamphetamine pouring into our country. Now let's add legalization and glorification of marijuana. And if that's not enough, let's add lack of mental health beds. The United States averages 12 mental health beds per 100,000 population with an estimated need of 40 beds per 100,000. Not enough. Put that all together, pandemic, more drugs, not enough mental health beds, and what happens? What happens is what I see in the emergency department every shift. Many mental health patients coming to the hospital with lack of capacity, and they spend days living in an emergency department, detoxifying from drugs and waiting for a bed or getting better with treatment and going home after two weeks of living in an emergency department. I joke, but it's sadly true that some of my emergency patients spend much more time in the emergency department than I do. And with that, let's hear our question of the day. Thank you, Congressman Kennedy, for your unwavering commitment and personal transparency regarding addiction and mental health. My name is Dr. Kristen Donovan, and I'm honored to have this opportunity to ask you a question. Uh, My question today is, what would you say are the top two to three things that our country needs to do in terms of prevention of drug addiction? And I'm seeking, if possible, for things that have not yet been done Um, looking for innovative strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Donovan, for your question and for your amazing work with the CCR team. I love working with the Center for Community Research that inspires innovations such as CREDO, the Community Response to Drug Overdose Task Force, uniting public health, public safety, and prevention. We have forged impactful projects such as fentanyl testing in hospitals and marijuana drug interaction info cards distributed at pharmacies. Dr. Donovan, we will work in your question into the conversation with Congressman Patrick Kennedy. During his time in Congress, Patrick J. Kennedy was the lead author of the landmark Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, also known as Federal Parity Law, which requires insurers to cover treatment for mental health and substance use disorder 
no more restrictively than treatment for illnesses of the body. As founder of the Kennedy Forum, he now unites advocates, policymakers, and business leaders to advance evidence-based practices and policies in mental health and addiction. You can find Congressman Patrick Kennedy's bio on the High Truth show notes. Congressman Patrick Kennedy, welcome to High Truths. Thank you, Dr. Lev. Great to be with you. It's really an honor to have you on the show. I'm one of your many admirers and part of your fan club and working on addiction and mental health, but you've had an amazing impact on my clinical practice as an emergency physician. Um, when I read your book, A Common Struggle, which is full of candid um, uh, uh, views on your life with bipolar disorder and addiction, and you told a scene about breaking your arm and going to the emergency department and getting a prscription, and that had a huge impact on me. Do you mind sharing that story no, with No, thank our you. Audience? And thanks for your being uh, one of our critical healthcare workers, uh, emergency room, emergency room doc on the front lines. I can't tell you the number of times I've been wheeled into emergency rooms because of my untreated addiction and mental illness. And it really shocks me that we don't have better designed emergency rooms to make sure that we have um, more accessible environments for people who are coming in with uh, mental health crises. I really think it's uh, another example of the blind spot that our medical system has had to meeting the needs of mental health emergencies, which as you know, are climbing every day, especially amongst our, our pediatric, our, our children's um, groups who uh, kids are coming in and being boarded in these uh, emergency rooms, totally the wrong place for, for anyone to be in a psychiatric emergency, but especially children. So anyway, I just want to first say uh, thank you for trying to put up with all of that. Um, we have a historic opportunity to change all of that, which is why I'm so grateful to you for what you do to put a spotlight on the changes that are needed in our society to address these issues of addiction. When I uh, came out of Congress, um, I um, was just getting sober really for the last time. I spent most of my life cycling in and out of rehab, much like many who I know who are in recovery with me. Um, because as you know, we have no chronic care a system to deal with addiction, much like we do with cardiovascular disease or diabetes or any other illness that requires kind of constant care. Um, addiction is not that way. We wait until it's a crisis before we treat it. And then, of course, we go back. And since it's a chronic illness, it doesn't go away. But the, but the medical care to deal with it does go away, unfortunately, because it isn't reimbursed on that chronic basis. So what happened to me is I got sober after I left uh, Congress, was finally able to change everything, as we say in recovery. I changed who I was with, what I did for a living, uh, my environment. I mean, I, I changed everything. It was my last, last effort to really finally get um, good sobriety. Um, so I started counting my days um, after I left Congress and, uh, in any event, I got uh, a couple of years under my belt and I, I also uh, started a family. And so one of the things that I was doing for my nieces and nephews at a family event is um, I was putting a ping pong table together and the ping pong table started to collapse. And unfortunately, I tried to save it from falling because I was, knew it was going to make a loud noise. And instead, what happened is like my hand. Uh, got caught in the ping pong table and my finger really got injured really badly. It was uh, a very uh, ugly situation, blood and everything. So I ran over to the emergency room. And when I went in, of course, the nurse and intake doctor said, you have to tell us, are you allergic to anything? And I said, um, well, I'm allergic to penicillin and I'm allergic to opioids. Well, I have to say that the nurse had never heard anyone say they were allergic to uh, opioids. And she said, well, what happens with opioids? I said, instead of breaking out in hives, like with penicillin, I break out in handcuffs. And uh, she, she kind of laughed and the doctor kind of chuckled. Oh, isn't that funny? 
Um, and so then they went and they sutured me up. And of course, because it was a busy ER, the doc moved around and I had a quote wound care nurse come in later to, to give me my prescription uh, for Percocet and, you know, the Bassett tracing and some, some bandages, you know, to get me on my way. Well, of course, for this addict, you know, given a prescription for Percocet, you know, my, my heart started pounding. I mean, I had been in recovery for a couple of years, but that doesn't uh, negate the fact that I, and my brain is wired for addiction. I want uh, to always get something to feel different. And when I've been given this opportunity, it, it was like on me. And of course, my rationalizing my addiction, which I've done my whole life, I said, I can manage this. I'll, I'll take the Percocet. I'll call my sponsor. I'll tell him that I'm only going to use it for the pain and just a couple of days, you know, because of course I have to get sleep. You know, these are all the delusions in our brain that we just use to justify our addiction. Mm -hmm. And um, luckily my wife had gotten someone to, to watch our kids so that she could come down to the emergency room after I had been there. And she came in the room at the exact time the nurse was giving me my prescription for Percocet. And literally she plucked it right out of my hands. And uh, I have to say, I'm so blessed that I have a wife who goes to Al-Anon and who really understands the importance of uh, 12 step recovery and my, my, her husband being active. So she lets me do whatever I need to do to stay sober. And I'm so lucky I have a relationship like that uh, because honestly, I never have. And and for those who are out there who have been through recovery, we all know if we have a partner who supports us in recovery, it's worth gold. Yes. So that story changed me be because as an emergency physician, how could I not give someone who has pain or I, I thought it was a broken arm that you, you talked about. How could I not give someone opioids for pain? We've been programmed out of medical school to do that. And your story gave me permission to say to say no. And I was one of the first physicians to start saying no, and, and I was told I was not compassionate. But I knew I was on the right track, because again, because you gave me permission. And, and your story is how your wife threw out those pills and saved your life. Um, that was very Im impactful and... Um, you know, made it made a difference on how I practice. Well, I, I will tell you, that wasn't just an isolated story. I had uh, we had five children and my wife said to me, enough with the kids. We have beautiful children. So she sent me to the urologist and same thing happened. I did the propofol. I made sure that I will never have children again. And at the end of it, when I woke up, they had already given me um uh, a, a narcotic for the pain. And of course that got my addiction rolling. And then they gave me some pills. And again, I was off to the races and my wife saved me again uh, before I had a chance to, um, to take the medication any further. But my point is, is that um, there are alternatives. There's a, uh, for surgeons, there is something called bivacaine, which you can put in the surgical area that basically numbs the nerves so that it actually reduces the pain threshold for people after surgery and then reduces the need for long term for opioids down the line. There's also, as you know, the Toradol and other um, non um, kind of. Uh, uh, opioid solutions. And yeah, so we, we can now actually treat pain better without opioids. Um, there's a whole surgical program, right, called ERAS. Um, there's all these catheters. There, there are, and I do that in the emergency department. If people have back pain or headache, I do nerve blocks, right? No opioids and better pain relief. So, yeah, no, and and frankly, Doctor Lev, we need to up at the, the Food and Drug Administration. The re and the NIH more research into non-addictive um, pain relievers, and 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 I understand there are ways to take some of the molecules from opioids that are not addictive and do not cause respiratory depression, and and to but yet still provide pain relief. 
But, you know, it's amazing that the pharmaceutical industry has not invested in this because pain is a very real public health crisis. And I don't want to take away from people's need for pain relief. Um, but, But that means, especially as we're taking the Purdue Pharmas of the world offline because of their abusive practices, um, we still need to fill in how are you going to deal with this if we're going to limit uh, opioids? There, there are people who do need this uh, real pain relief. So I am really outraged that the federal government has not made a bigger priority of investing in and fast tracking. We saw how quickly we fast tracked a COVID vaccination. I wish we could fast track a pain um, a remedy which I believe we can. I've talked to enough neuroscientists. They have a number of promising molecules. I'm just so uh, outraged that we have not done enough to to push that research forward. You know, I know this is why I love you so much. Um, You have the same jealousy. I always say I'm jealous of infectious diseases. I'm jealous of COVID and so are you. So I love... I love hearing that. It's like, wait, we could do all this for COVID and we can't do this for something that's actually a bigger long-term public health hazard in in our country. And I do think the medical community has stepped up, um, not as much as we could, um, but but I do see amazing innovations for pain without without opioids. Um, Let me ask you about um, the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis. You were a Pointed to that, um, and what do you think happened with that? Has it been successful? Where are we? So I was uh, honored to be invited by former Governor Chris Christie, Republican, and uh, Democratic Governor Cooper, Republican Governor Baker, um, Bertha Madras from Harvard. We had a really high-level group on this issue. We really curated a lot of policies that we felt could help address the opioid and addiction crisis in general. Um, About half of those were on the interdiction uh, kind of supply side, and then the other half were things that we could do to help reduce demand. Um, I really made it my priority to make sure parity was a presidential priority because The real um, tragedy of these hundreds of thousands of people's lives who are losing to the addiction crisis is the fact it's not just the Purdue Pharmas who get them addicted through their unscrupulous and corrupt marketing of things like Oxycontin, but it's also the insurance companies who have systematically denied treatment for addiction. And I see that as the other kind of, if you will, libel party in this whole uh, terrible tragedy of this overdose crisis that we have. Because keep in mind, it's not just them lighting the fuse. It's the fact that we've never been there to put out the fuse when our fellow Americans are suffering from addiction. We've never treated it um, adequately. And in large part, that's because insurance companies have not reimbursed for it as they should. So parity was really my um, real focus. And I'm really pleased to say we got full support for parity um, under Republican president, uh, backed by all the Republicans on the committee, and uh, even the Department of Labor uh, secretary, um, Republican, said he can't see a federal law not being enforced. Um, and so uh, and I worked with uh, Republican senators who really believe that it was unfair that the taxpayer ends up picking up these people who fall through the insurance claims process because their private insurance denies them coverage for addiction and they sink in their addiction. And guess what? They end up on the public payroll because they um, the safety net is the Medicaid and then, then it's other um, public finance supports, which means that the insurance industry is making a profit off of literally denying care for people who, by the way, bought this insurance to cover all their medical needs, including their mental health and addiction needs, but for whom that promise 
has never been fulfilled by the insurance industry. So in a way, I got my populist Republican friends to all agree that this was a corporate subsidy where by letting insurance companies off the hook from their obligations to cover addiction, essentially we're subsidizing their profits, which as you know, are enormous. So at the same time, so many people are dying from uh, um, not getting access to the care that could save their lives. I'm, I'm so impressed with your boots on the ground understanding of what's happening. You know, as, you know, you're like the Congressman Kennedy, but yet you understand what's happening in day-to-day life because that's exactly what I see. We, you know, we've I've spent my entire career, you know, working in inner city, underserved areas, but when it comes to mental health and addiction, they actually have the best care. And it's my neighbors who can't, who don't have access, you know, who can't afford it um, for, for certain types of disease process. Exactly what you're saying, not a popular thing to say. Um, but- you're absolutely right, Dr. Lev. Like, if you're really, really wealthy, you can pay cash and get what you need. If you're really, really poor, you know, through Medicaid, you get something. Not always very uh, good, uh, but it's something, and often it's more comprehensive than what you would get through commercial insurance. But if you're middle class and you want to try to get access to a provider, good luck. Your payer does not have adequate in-network benefit for you so that you don't have to pay lower out-of-pocket expenses. When it's an emergency in your family, you'll pay for whatever you need to And what ends up happening is you have to go out of network, which means you have a much higher bill afterwards since it's out of network. That is a violation, in essence, of the parity law, because it means a higher financial threshold for people seeking mental health and addiction care to to bear than they would have to if they were looking for care for diabetes, where there's an adequate in-network capacity of providers. So you set things rolling um, with with that opioid commission, when I was at the the White House, we held an an event and we brought in insurance companies um, to bring about the parity and to fix that that gap. And there was a lot of enthusiasm. We're not there yet. Where where do you think we need to go? Well, we have been a uh, go slow on this, and the reason is uh, because when we passed the Affordable Care Act, we needed the insurance companies to help get it passed. So when it did pass, and of course it was getting challenged all the time, the Obama administration was very reticent to really step on the toes of the ones that brought you to the dance, right? So at the same time, we never really put the eyes on this law because when, frankly, we passed this law in essence in the dead of night. Um, H.R. 1424, which is my bill for the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, only passed because I got Chris Dodd, who's a family friend. He was also chairman of the banking committee in 2008 when we needed to pass the big bank bailout bill. He got the whole $700 billion TARP bailout, which was a necessity for us to pass in order to save our economy from another, quote, financial Great Depression. and. That bill on the Economic Stabilization Act was written into the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act because Chris wanted to make sure we pass the parity law. And the only way to pass the parity law was to attach it to this Economic Stabilization Act. So the bill to protect our country from another financial Great Depression was actually a bill that required coverage for depression be reimbursed by payers. Again, you can't make this up, but when George W. Bush um, signed it into law, there was no recognition that the underlying bill was a mental health bill because, frankly, the, the bill wasn't passed because a bunch of consumers and families got up in arms and had a big march on Washington and called their senators and reps because, as we know, stigma is still so alive and well, and people don't want to self-identify which means we don't have a very strong advocacy community to push legislation like the parity bill or other bills um, like we do with environmental advocacy or labor advocacy or small business advocacy. We just have to do a better job at building 
um, that advocacy movement still. And if we do build that advocacy movement, we can push implementation of parity enforcement or other important mental health and addiction issues, not only on the federal level, but on the state level, where often it can make as much of a difference as anywhere else, because a lot of the answers to the opioid crisis and to addiction in general and mental health are being put together at the state level, because it's the state budget that often covers a lot of the uh, what is known as the social determinants of health, housing, transportation, education, uh, support of living. So we really need um, to have advocacy and boots on the ground in the states, much like we have to have boots on the ground in D.C. But we're still, Dr. Lev, really got our hands uh, tied because a lot of people still are not comfortable putting their hand up and saying like they would cancer today, which of course was different of a generation ago. And like they say, well, I have breast cancer. Well, we don't have people putting their hand up and saying, you know, I have addiction or I have mental illness. It's changing, especially for Gen X and Z, especially, but we're, we're not moving quite as fast as we need to in order to get all of these important bills passed into law. Well, I'm very much appreciate of you and then the expertise that you have in maneuvering laws and getting done what you were able to do. And I know that you um, you went to your father and, and um, you know, to on how to get that done. You were able to do that. Uh, congratulations. You, you mentioned the issue of stigma. I want to ask your opinion on this. The, the issue of stigma is important as your first story of, you know, uh, and and your ba- bravery of coming out and saying, I do have a mental health problem, I have an addiction. Um, we, we don't want to have stigma on human beings who have a chronic illness, who have whatever challenge that they have. We don't want stigma on people. And yet I see this going a little too far when people don't want to have stigma on drug use at all. Um, you know, the latest thing that I thought was a little bit ridiculous is that they don't want to release the number of how many children are overdosing on fentanyl and marijuana because it would be stigmatizing to their parents. And yet we don't want people to use drugs. Stigma is a tool, right? We, we don't want people to smoke. That's, you know, that's a bad habit. We, but we have compassion on the smokers. Can, can you elaborate on that? Have we gone a little too far? I mean, or where there's a balance in that? My feeling is that the public health of our nation demands that we do everything we can to protect our public health. And you don't protect our public health if you allow the alcohol industry to freely advertise hard liquor on television. That was never the case when I was growing up. Um, Now, because of cable TV, they found a way around and, and when I turn on the television, they have these um, sweetened hard lemonades and hard seltzers and everything. And, uh, and it's all dressed up much like the tobacco industry created like flavored cigarettes and Joe Camel. I mean, they were targeting kids. Let's just be honest. This was yeah. the marketing. They show all these kids having a good time. And I'm telling you, they are targeting kids. They know if they get kids early, they've got them for a lifetime. And why, Dr. Lev, we haven't learned from Purdue Pharma, we know the abuses of companies that stand to make a huge profit based upon how many consumers they can get to consume their product. So if their product is addiction, you know, they just want to jack up the rolls because like in liquor, they say drink responsibly, but honest to God, they're not making their profits over those of those that take a one or two drinks. They make their profits off of people like me who are profound alcoholic and drink more than my share. And frankly, that's where their profits come from. So the last thing in my view that we want is we don't want the government to go into business itself because they need the tax revenue to with the big marijuana, which are really the big tobacco companies coming back to life. And they are the biggest investors in this new big tobacco, which is really big marijuana. And by getting more people to use their product because they have a financial incentive to do so, 
basically, Dr. Lev, more of our population who are exposed mean more of our population who may have that predisposition genetically to addiction, like ran in my family. It means you're going to capture a lot more people who are going to create a problem of addiction than would otherwise be the case if you did not have this commercial industry constantly trying to push out their product. I have five children. When it came to my town allowing for pot shops to sell THC-infused gummy bears and THC-infused uh, soft drinks like Fanta Grape Aid with THC in it, which is the, as you know, the psychedelic impact of, of the marijuana uh, plant, uh, uh, I was able with my neighbors to say no we're not going to have our children walk by those pot shops on their way home. And we don't want, you know, it's in my, when I was growing up, you could smell when someone was smoking there today, mm -hmm. people eat it through edibles and they drink it. I, I have a tough enough time trying to track what my 14 year old is doing on the internet. Right. I, I, I can't even manage to keep up with technology and how, software companies are trying to hook our kids on on digital addictions because of their uh, of the the you know, the TikToks and the and the Instagrams and everything that are really priming our kids for for addiction. They had neuroscientists help these software companies come up with the most addictive uh, content to keep the kids scrolling on their phones and watching as they play these video games like incessantly. So all I'm saying is you've got video gamers, you've got social media, you've got commercialized new uh, mar big marijuana, you, you're blowing out the um, advertising on, on alcohol, hard liquor. All I'm saying is, I mean, when are we gonna stand up for the public health? Because not for nothing, but we're not only consigning the next generation to a lot more addiction than they would otherwise have to face. We're doing so with the real idea because of this pandemic that there are going to be a lot more kids out there who are going to be vulnerable to these marketing practices because, frankly, they have much higher anxiety rates. As we've seen, anxiety and depression have skyrocketed under the COVID pandemic. So you combine the tsunami of children's mental health, at the same time, you're pushing out all these new addictive products. I mean, what do we expect the answer to be? Other than more kids who are gonna develop addiction, more kids as we know who are at prone and really at risk to developing mental illness, especially given the potency of these THC products. I mean, when I used to smoke marijuana, it was, you know, one, two percent. Now the average uh, percentage of potency is 15 percent. And there are a lot of products which are like crack cocaine, which are really uh, extracts with 90 percent THC, which you you smoke much like you would crack cocaine. And it, it literally you know, blows your brain back with its impact and, and how we could think that's a good thing for our country to be exposed to. I'm all for not making, making sure people don't go to jail, but we already know that with more addiction, more people are going to go to jail. It's a real lie that the, the proponents of, of commercialized marijuana, when they say, oh, we're trying to get lower incarceration for our, our black and brown communities. It's the exact opposite that's happening because what's happened is we have not dealt with the real uh, impact of, of unconscious racial bias um, and systemic racism, thank, frankly, embedded in our, in our justice system, which is the reason why we have such a disproportionate number of people of color. And the thought that we wouldn't address that as the objective of justice reform, as opposed to think we're somehow going to solve this um, racial overrepresentation of minorities in our correction system, when we know that that's not what happens. We have actually an increase 
in black and brown communities being arrested. This time, in large measure, it's because of the increased use amongst minority communities because of the increased access and prevalence of these drugs. And by the way, just like with alcohol, marijuana pot shops are 13 times more likely to be in black neighborhoods and brown neighborhoods than they're likely to be in in the community that I live in. So maybe my community is able to protect our kids. What happened to the kids in Pleasantville and Atlantic City who are going to just get rolled over because in addition to the a liquor store every other block, they're going to have marijuana sold. And by the way, these are kids who are subject to increased kind of racial trauma, vicarious trauma from all of the racial pandemic, increased economic trauma because of the, especially the lower socioeconomic groups that are victims, most the biggest victims of the COVID um, economic impact. All I'm saying is it, 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 why as a nation, and especially as a Democrat, we would allow the public health to get, you know, uh, compromised all for the big profits of corporate big tobacco and big marijuana who want to exploit and make money off of really vulnerable populations who will use these products in order to address their undertreated mental health issues. Congressman, you have so many insights and really helped me in, in, in my approach to the issue of, of, of drugs and, and mental health. I see what I see on the ground, and I've realized over the years that I'm like the canary in the coal mine. I kind of see what's happening in society before the rest of society uh, sees it. And I ask every patient I see who uses um, fentanyl um, what their journey was for drugs. And Every single one, I have yet to meet a single person who uses fentanyl that didn't start their path with marijuana. And usually at a very young age, I'm like shocked, 10 years old, 12 years old. Um, And not everybody who uses marijuana ends up using fentanyl, but I haven't met a single person who uses fentanyl that didn't start with marijuana. Yeah, well, as you know, if we commercialize in more states, there's going to be more young people who are going to get access to it than otherwise. And what happens is we de-risk the whole idea of using marijuana because we call it medical and it's helpful for this and that. When we ignore the very detrimental um, impact that marijuana has on the brain. Um, and people get kind of really uh, mixed messages because it keeps being called medical when in fact, as you know, it has a very detrimental impact on the brain. What, uh, I, I'd be interested in hearing your perspective. I think it's an insult on my profession. I mean, I had to go to like very painful training, medical school, residency, and, and the scrutiny that I have as a, as a physician. I can't give you an aspirin without a history, physical exam, differential diagnosis, drug interactions um, for me to practice medicine. And, and to call it as medicine, I'm really you know, surprised that the medical community in general didn't have more of an outrage. I feel like they've hijacked the word medical in this. Yes, no question. It was very insidious marketing on the part of big marijuana industry. They knew they had to de-risk it. They got the nose under the camel's, uh, the camel's nose under the tent with, quote, medicalizing it, saying, that, oh, we need it for people with seizure disorders. Hey, listen, I'm all for finding uh, and expediting cannabinoid-based solutions that go through the rest of the FDA um, regulatory process in order to get those people the kind of uh, seizure relief that they need. Or if you're a cancer patient and need, well, there's Marinol. And by the way, there's other um, cannabinoid-based products. But the idea that we're going to commercialize all the marijuana for For this population, it disregards the very real medical impact on people's mental health. It's like we're saying, oh, addiction and mental health don't matter. We're only going to care about patients with these illnesses. And my I just find that so much uh, of a disregard for people. But well, it actually, it's not even a disregard. You're hurting people. So you, so you know how many people come to the emergency department with seizures because of marijuana, right? So that's what happens. It's like, oh, 
marijuana is good for seizures. No, it's not. CBD is good for a very select part of babies who have special seizures. These babies weren't smoking pot. Um, and yet people think that it's good for seizures and they come into the emergency room with seizures because THC actually decreases the seizure threshold. And you could look at Marinol, it says it right on the FDA label. Um, but yet we're actually hurting the public with this disinformation. It's the reason why we have the FDA. Like we, we really need to have these products just validated. And uh, so people aren't misled. So I went to the FDA while at ODCP and said, why aren't we doing more about the issue of marijuana? And they said, well, it's federally illegal, so we can't touch it. And that was the excuse to not to disregard all the medical claims on marijuana. How do we fix that? Well, as I said, back to advocacy, um, this the money behind commercialization is so big. It, it reminds me of the money behind Purdue Pharma. There was so much money to be made off addiction. I think that really reduces the claims uh, to protect the public health. It always has, whether it's alcohol or tobacco you know, Purdue Pharma, it, it, you know, public health really doesn't stand to win against these big financial interests. And that plays itself out in a lot of in, in, insidious regulatory and statutory changes, which are driven by big money. Interesting. So Dr. Kristen Donovan is the CEO for Center for Community Research, who I work with, and she works on issues of opioids, methamphetamines, marijuana, she has a question to you. Um, she says, what would be the top two to three things that our country needs to do in terms of prevention of drug addiction and perhaps things that we haven't done? And she's looking for like innovations and strategies. What would you, um, what would your advice be to her? And Well, we have a historic opportunity to shift the paradigm on what we think of when we think of education with the public pronouncements of an emergency amongst children's mental health, combined with the whole, how do we reintegrate kids into school post-COVID, combined with the, just the challenges kids are facing today, we need to think differently about education. Um, what we need to do is make sure that kids learn how to self-modulate, in other words, how do they understand, it may be in health class or um, anatomy or, or whatever, you could, you could basically put this into any kind of part of the curriculum. You wouldn't even add to add, you just could put it in. So they learn about their amygdalas and how their fear response uh, because of stress can override their prefrontal cortex, which mediates whether they make sound, rational decisions. Like if we then also teach kids problem solving skills, God forbid that we um, role play and simulate ways to, for kids to handle the enormous stress that is on kids today, mm -hmm. um, especially with their overutilization of technology, they need coping mechanisms, frankly, in a way that they may not have needed a generation ago, where before we had ubiquitous technology. All I'm saying is, then you go up to the higher ed level, and we know the suicides are, and mental health impact on higher ed is enormous. And then you go up to the workforce. The workforce, as most every CEO in America will tell you, is not prepared to deal with the really toxic stress that um, a technology uh, transformation and employment transformation has had on workers. In other words, what was a generation ago when we didn't have enough math, science, and technology for our kids? You know, corporate America said, listen, we're, the Chinese are just beating our pants off in terms of the number of scientists, technology experts, and math. We need to do that in our country. And again, we came up with a STEM program, science and technology and math. We need to do the same today to build the worker of tomorrow, which means we need to prepare our young people how to deal with stress. You cannot learn your numeracy and your literacy 
and your science and history if you don't, if you can't absorb the information. And if your amygdala is on fire because you come from a traumatic background, which so many kids come from today, add COVID on top of that. Kids need to understand how to uh, self-regulate. And that needs to be part of our, our education. Now, if we do that, kids, in my view, will have more of a, will be armored up in kind of a military term so that they can, you know, take incoming, they can take flack without getting taken offline because they're protected. We'll, we'll help protect our young people as they're going forward in life. They'll, we'll, they'll have tools to not be beat down by stress and they'll be able to manage it and they won't be turning to drugs and alcohol really as a self-medicating tool. That's just my philosophy. I think you're right on target. And if we learn from history and, and even recent history, like the opioid prescription epidemic, I think our opioid prescription epidemic, like the Percocets you got in the emergency department, that's over. I mean, the data shows that we're at record low opioid prescriptions. The, the medical community has heard that message and, and turned that faucet off. We could still do better as far as safe prescribing and combinations, but in general, that's that's done. And the way we did it is not by buprenorphine or treatment opiate use disorder. We ended that in a relatively short, you know, 10, 20 year period on the front end on, on supply um, and, and innovations in pain. And so I think you're right on target when it comes to the issue of, of all drugs, um, uh, marijuana, alcohol, et cetera, is, is focusing on youth. Um, uh, well, you know, while treatment is important, but if we wanted to end addiction, and that's a big if, I wonder if this country wants to end it because it's it's no, lucrative you know, business. We're, we're Americans. We love our addictions in America. We just, you know, we're, but I would say that um, we, we really need to think about all those kids who are traumatized. The adverse childhood experience studies by Kaiser demonstrate that they're much higher risk for all kinds of maladaptive behaviors if they're subject to stress, their brain is too filled with cortisol at an early stage in life, really primes the brain for, for addiction and mental illness. So if that's the case, why aren't we intervening to protect our kids? Now, with addiction, we wait till it's a stage four illness, right? We don't treat it like we do cancer with stage one intervention. So one of the more fundamental changes we need to make in order to address addiction is we need to do prevention. Prevention is really left out of the equation. And we could do so much even in supporting families to be better equipped to know how themselves to bring up, you know, uh, uh, strong, resilient kids. You know, as a father, no one gave me the handbook on, on the neuro development of my child and how I might, as someone who passionately loves my child, wants the best for them, what are the things that I can do to maximize the opportunities for my children? Now, because I'm in mental health, obviously, I talk to a lot of people like I know that I just got to wrap my arms around those children and I got to love on them. I got to read stories to them. I got to connect with them. I got to put my cell phone down when they're around so that I don't get anything between my eyes right on them because it fills them up. It gives them emotional stability and regulation. Um, these are things that aren't just social science. We have the neurobiology understood today that a parent's attention, love, and by the way, if I'm healthier, if I know how to self-regulate, my kids stand a better chance of not repeating the cycle of addiction in my family. So, so we just have to take a multi-pronged approach here. And, uh, and it begins by addressing the current addiction crisis. So all those parents who are using out there because they don't have their addictions treated aren't passing that on to their kids either. I love your, your cancer analogy. I usually use infectious disease or a blood transfusion analogy, like a blood transfusion is like treatment, but we need to plug the hole and, and, and prevent. So would you say like harm reduction, that'd be like palliative care for cancer treatment, um, but we want to prevent cancer in the first place? 
Yeah, no, I mean, I wish we were doing a whole lot more to show how much we could reduce the total number of people in our population that are subject to addiction if we do not la allow a new commercial industry that peddles addiction to come in and sell to our public. I'd like to regulate social media so they're not priming our kids with addiction. I'd like to really understand how do we do a better job in our schools to prepare our kids to, to manage stress? All of these things taken together. And finally, you know, on the harm reduction side, I'm all for meeting people where they are. Uh, I, I mean, I was a big supporter of needle exchange because I don't want people to get HIV. Um, I also want to use that as a, a gateway to get them into treatment, right? Now, most of the supervised injection sites data that I have seen shows very little engagement between the person who's come in to a supervised injection site and that person getting access to treatment. I hear it's in the one, two, three percent at tops. Now, that does not justify, in my view, because if I need to use six times a day, which is way a lot of addicts need to feed their addiction. I'm not going to go into a supervised injection site six times a day. So while on the face of it, it looks like it's addressing the problem in another way, I think what it is, is a, it's, it's a smoke screen, frankly, for us not doing what we need to do. And that's get people the treatment they need. If we create a bigger epidemic of addiction because we commercialize a drug like marijuana, we're not going to be able to provide the addiction treatment for the increased population that's now going to become addicted because we allowed that addictive industry to come and sell their product to our country. It just is maddening to me why in the midst of a mental health epidemic, we're adding to that mental health addiction epidemic by adding a new commercialized um, drug. I like what you say with harm reduction. You say you, you're for meeting people where they are, but you don't want to keep them there. Um, my my view on- I kind of feel, Dr. Lev, there's this philosophy like we're never going to get our arms around this. So let's just try to do the least and the cheapest way of solving the problem, which is let them use over there. We'll have some naloxone. We'll make sure we resuscitate them. That to me is a defeatist, and it's an insult to the disease. We would never treat cancer like that. Oh, you know, we, you can just do this over here. We demand a higher standard for medicine, and it's not being applied to people with addiction. Yeah, so I mean, thinking the harm reduction and palliative care is like, well, you have cancer, you're going to die anyway. We're not going to treat your cancer, so here's some palliative care. The, the problem I have with, with the consumption sites is... I see it as an outrage of resources. As an emergency physician, I have, you know, uh, an ER full of patients who may want to get sober and no place to send them. And yet we're going to invest money on places to use when you could use anywhere. People are using all over town. They're using on buses, in the streets, in the shelters. There's no lack of space to use. We could make that use safer. But and, and We could get more test strips out there for people to test for fentanyl, but we need to tie all this together with getting people into treatment. Yes. And um, and people don't want to take away all of the impact that the criminal justice system has on this. And I can't tell you how many people I know in recovery who would not be there if it weren't for the angels wearing blue, our law enforcement who saved them and got them, or a good judge who got them into what I did in Congress is I supported um, you know, recovery courts, drug courts, mental health courts, veterans courts, so that our veterans were put in jail. We would pre-adjudicate people with addiction and get them into treatment, but they had a, a, a mandate. And, and believe me, you need motivation to get treatment when you're first trying to get free of addiction. You need motivations. And contingency management is what really we should use the justice system for. Um, With the gold standard for methamphetamine that doesn't have medicines to treat. Right. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Congressman, I, I enter the emergency department every day, and sometimes it feels like a third world country. I will walk over bodies from the parking lot and checking on people to see if they're alive. And then once in the emergency department, I have patients, like you mentioned at the very beginning of this podcast, who are living 
they're living in my emergency department for like two weeks at a time. And if it's if it's adolescents, they could be in the emergency department for months with no bed, no capacity. Um, and really, that's probably the better, bread and butter of my job in the emergency department is treating mental health, acute mental health crisis in a very frustrating way. Just like you said, not probably the worst place to to treat someone with a with a crisis in a loud emergency department. What about the concept of opening up more mental health beds and institutions? Well, there's no doubt we need to get rid of the uh, institutions for mental disease exclusion, which preempts um, us be it building those beds out. But bottom line is we need to have integrated medical care where you as a physician have an EMR that also includes whether a person has been in recovery, if they suffer from addiction. If you do not know when you wheel me in that I am someone uh, who is uh, on Vivitrol and then you give me uh, drugs because that Vivitrol is protected by a special privacy called a code 42 CFR, you're gonna kill me. You could very well kill me. I think this 42 CFR needs to be reformed. This is not 30 years ago when the DEA used that data to go and decide whose doors to kick down. Obviously we can put extra protections, but HIPAA should apply like it does for sexually transmitted diseases and other um, illnesses people don't want anyone to know about. So. I, I just think that we need integrated care. We need to. In, in, I always say your privacy shouldn't kill you, right? Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. And the disease, if it's a medical disease, it needs to be treated like a medical disease, not as some uh, right. stigma, moral failing, which is the way we continue to treat it when we don't include it in the EMR. Right. So, um, in in wow, we talked about so many things today. It's amazing. Um, I, I want to close with kind of something uplifting. Tell me about your uh, Kennedy Foundation and, and and your vision and how we're going to get there. Well, thanks. Uh, I created the Kennedy Forum on the fiftieth anniversary of President John F. Kennedy um, signing the Community Mental Health Act of nineteen sixty three, which is the last bill he signed before he was assassinated. And it really spells out that you can't deal with mental health, addiction, uh, intellectual disability if you silo the treatment. You need to have a community-based approach, which means today you need to have social determinants of health. You need to have supportive community supports, housing, um, education involved. You need to have the ed- a whole system approach because we don't just need pharmaceutical companies in the medical system. That's not going to deal with this entirely. We need to, we need to, to move earlier on in the process, support people in their communities, like I said earlier. So the Kennedy Forum is trying to do this, and I'd encourage people to go on our website. We have tools for people if they've been denied insurance coverage for mental health and addiction issues to learn how to appeal that denial but also to learn how to get active as advocates, whether they themselves or their family members want to sign up for this new movement. We need people to sign up as advocates. Every other special interest has people willing to carry the banner. I can tell you, we need more soldiers in our recovery army. And anybody listening, you know, go on the kennedyforum.org and uh, we need your help out there. And, and by the way, NAMI's great, Mental Health America. There's a lot of great organizations who we work with, and we're all in it together, but we need more of you to, to join the ranks um, for this effort. Great. Well, I'm honored to be a soldier. Congressman, you have done so much for me in improving um, my ability to treat patients. Is there anything else I could do for you besides join, uh, join uh, your forum and be a soldier? You are the best. I uh, I appreciate this. We, it's an ongoing uh, effort, and I love trying to help others like you do because it gets me out of myself, and it's the magic of recovery. So I want to thank uh, all of my fellows who are in recovery with me because I wouldn't be sober today if I weren't in recovery with other people trying to get sober. I learn from them, and I benefit when I'm able to help them um, and uh, hopefully are able to provide 
um, some story that they can get uh, some value out of. And that's how we all help each other. So thank you, Dr. Lev, for what you do. It's so important. That's beautiful. And Dr. Donovan, thank you for your question and your leadership with the Center of Community Research. I absolutely love working with a creative, professional, and friendly team. What a blessing to work with people that you love and enjoy so much. And thank you so much, Congressman Kennedy. Your work in mental health and addiction is really, to me, a gold standard for a country. And blessings of health for all your work, your mental health, and your family. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you for listening to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. This week's episode would not be possible without the generous support from our sponsor. A sincere and warm thank you to Isaac, the International Academy on the Science and Impact of Cannabis, doctors educating on the harms of marijuana. Visit IsaacOne.org, I-A-S-I-C one.org to view their medical library translated for public understanding, listen to their speaker series, and follow the science. Our producer is Dave Rivas from Davey Boy Productions. I am your host, Dr. Ronit Lev. We hope we brought your day a little bit more high truths. Thank you.